general deer, they save 20% of the quota for youth. That and get an educated guess. Yeah. And with all the new elk management plan, people are going to be spread all over the board and jumping from hunts to different hunts. Yeah. So terrible investment if you don't incorporate general deer, unless you get lucky. Welcome to the Built to Hunt podcast, brought to you by the team of hunt advisors at the Hunt and Fool magazine, where we are dedicated to helping our members go on more hunts with better information. Join Hunt and Fool today at huntandfool.com. I'm just going to kind of kick things off, hand it over to the folks with the knowledge at Hunt and Fool and uh, kind of take in and absorb the information as well, just like all of you guys. So I'll kind of kick it over, let you guys introduce yourselves a little bit and uh, get rolling. <laughs> Spread on that in this time. Sounds good. I'm Austin Atkinson here. <clears throat> Fortunate enough to live in Cedar City, Utah, Southern Utah here, and been at the Hunt and Fool for about eight years and love making Utah my home. I did not grow up here. I grew up in Arizona, so Utah is still new to me. But as a resident, you got to learn. Yeah. And I'm, I'm Garth Jensen. Um, I've been with Hunt and Fool now for nine years. And Utah has been, yeah, I'm born and raised here. So I've spent all my life in Utah, specifically here in Southern Utah. I'm fortunate enough to be able to have a good job where I can stay in Southern Utah and still afford to live here. Um, but yeah, I've seen everything from the ups and the downs that I remember when it was this and I remember when it was that. And so it's it kind of it's kind of nice to be able to be one of them old guys that say, God, I remember when there was deer out there. You were doing that when you were 17. You were acting like an old man. I was. <laughs> All right. Jared Lyle here from The Hunt and Fool. Uh, honored to be here tonight. I am our weakest link on the Utah panel. I'll be hammering out answers to questions at high levels, mostly being a mute. Uh, while these two rain knowledge bombs down around the state of Utah. I uh, love being here. I uh, moved to Utah. I guess I've been here at Hunt and Fool about seven years now and moved down here with my wife. Absolutely love it. And there's more hunting opportunity here than I give credit for and love every minute in the woods. Perfect. We're going to kick it off with some high level stuff about Utah. Most of our presentation tonight uh, comes from a non-resident perspective, but if you are a resident, you can still find some valuable nuggets. But we realize there's a lot of people that want to come to Utah, have dreamed of hunting Utah. So we're going to go through everything you need to know. But the biggest change this year right out of the gate is everyone was used to applying in Utah in February with an early March deadline. That's how it's been for quite some time. And now, due to some changes that we requested as hunters, and they have bumped that application deadline back till April 27. So the application is open now and it'll close April 27th. And that's just for all big game species, bucks, bulls, and once in a lifetime. You must have a valid hunting license to apply. So what that means is the day you buy your license will start the 365 day license if you just buy a one year. And when you go to apply next year, as long as you apply when the application is open, it's usually open about five weeks, and your license is still valid, you can apply with that same license next year and essentially get two years in the big game draw with one license. And for everyone out there, this wasn't a conspiracy theory that the game and fish decided to bump the deadline back. So everybody that bought licenses last year had to buy them again this year. They bumped it back so that we could actually have tag numbers or at least recommended permit numbers. Yep. And those should be coming out tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yep. So the schedule in Utah, it's, it's a little complex, but more simple than other states. So what we do is the wildlife board will approve all the hunts you can apply for. So they say this has a tag. This doesn't have a tag. They don't tell you how many tags at that point but they tell you all the hunts that are eligible for non-residents or residents to apply for early January. Then they compile all their data and they post recommended permit numbers this week, mm -hmm. like Gar said tomorrow. Then the following two weeks, they will do regional meetings where they take public comments. They do voting around the regions, make sure everybody's on board with how many permits have been set. So at that point, they're not canceling hunts or creating new hunts. The season dates and the hunt has already been approved. They're just setting the permit numbers. Then we apply 
before they're finally approved, yeah. right? So the deadline's April 27th. They won't make a final vote on permit numbers until May 4th. What that does is allow the draw to happen after May 4th, and we'll have results by May 31st. But every non-resident out there that's applied in Utah can can appreciate this move back in the draw deadline date because now at least we're going to have an idea of what those permit numbers are going to be. And there's a lot of times for non-resident hunters that it's a difference between one and two permits. I mean, let's take sheep, for example. There was a long time where there was only one permit available for both Rocky and that in each unit and desert. Well, then all of a sudden they give you the same units that were due last year or same units that they had last year, but you had no idea what, you know, what one was going to have yep. at least two permits. So one went in the bonus. Then all of a sudden, after everyone's applied, they come out and say, oh, guess what? We're going to have two in this unit. You might have max points and you didn't even know it. You couldn't change. You couldn't change your application. So it's pretty important that move they did this year. It is. A couple other changes this year uh, to take note of. Starting this year in July, they did increase the license fee cost. So it's going from a $72 hunt license for non-residents up to $120. It'll also go up for residents, but uh, minimal. Yeah, not a few dollars. So if you're looking at needing a license for every year, you can buy a multi-year license at that current $72 level. If you want to try to play the other every other year game, um, consider that when you look at the $120 increase for next year's license. You can now edit your application online um, before the deadline of April 27th. So if you apply now, no problem. You start researching permit numbers, you can go in and change that and they're not gonna ding you with the application fee of $15 again. Yeah, so, so yeah. you used to have to pull withdraw that application and then reapply. Correct. So it's really nice they made that thing yeah. this year. So like I've already applied in Utah and then do a little more research. You can go in and adjust your units if you want. Yep. Talked about permit recommendations. There is a new OHV law. Uh, you have to take a course if you're going to operate in Utah, residents and non-residents. It's a free online course, and you take it once, and it lasts forever. <laughs> Unless you're a youth, then and, then, and then they charge you 35 bucks. It's a little bit backwards from what we're used to on that, yeah. but a lot of people aren't going to know that going into it because this hasn't got a lot of press anywhere. Yep. But that is something that they could issue a citation for if you are operating an OHV yep. uh, on state or federal land. Mm -mm. And we'll talk more about it. So a high level question is why so long? If you set the hunts in December, January, why do we just barely talk about permit numbers in April? You know, some states, they'll set two or three years of permit numbers and then just let the draws ride. But Utah is very concerned about having the most up-to-date, accurate data when they set these permit numbers. So everybody who shoots a bull elk, a deer, or an antelope, even a lot of the once in lifetimes, they'll send tooth packets to you, and they want you to return the front two incisor teeth. They will get those aged with cementum age analysis, and they compile all that data so they know what is the trend of the age of the animals harvested. They look at their winter survey data. They compile all the modeling for their buck to doe ratios in on the ground and aerial surveys that they do. So they do all this work in the winter, early spring, and that's why it takes so long. You know, we're into April before they say, this is how many permits we're going to have for this fall. And realistically, like in a year like this year where we're getting heavy winters in portions of Utah, this is going to be an ever evolving. They're probably going to be updating these permit recommendations like up until the wildlife board meeting. Yep. So it, it, it's very important that they get that accurate information and up to date. That's right. So big question we'll try to answer tonight as we go species by species is, should I even play in the Utah game? And how long should I play in the game? It's important to understand, like Gar said, it's a hybrid draw or there's a bonus permit or preference component and a random component. So you can draw on your very first year applying in Utah. Everybody has a chance. At least 50% of those permits will go to the guys with the most points that applied for that hunt. But if the other half goes random, if there's only one permit available, which happens a lot on non-resident hunts, it's random no matter how many points you have. You get extra chances for your points, but realistically, there's 
a lot of people throwing in for these draws in Utah. It's a very popular state. So realize you may be looking at some horrible random odds if you're chasing the very best hunts. Yeah, well, I agree. Sound, sound, nailed it. A <laughs> uh, little bit if you're not familiar with Utah, um, you should come to Utah. Like we live in Utah. We love it. We like Southern Utah. But there is a ton of public land in Utah. And this is one reason why it is so popular of a state for people to want to hunt in. We got seventy one percent overall public land. That's a lot, and and most of it is scattered throughout Utah. I mean, there's a there's definitely more of a consensus of private land in and around like the I fifteen corridor, uh, especially up in that Salt Lake Valley. You get a lot of heavy private land up in the mountains up there. But realistically, a lot of these units here, and most of the units that I would say are limited entry type hunts, have plenty of public land. You can do a DIY hunt there. Um, any any of them are very substantial in that. The the private land program on the CWMU it's similar to what uh, Colorado has. If you're familiar with their RFW, the Ranching for Wildlife, basically you own enough property, the state comes in and you can file for your own hunting unit as long as you have enough acreage in around there. For non-residents, you're going to have to buy the tag. Um, it's a draw for residents only if you want to do that. But if you got enough money. You can go in and just buy a tag and you can circumvent the draw. We also have land, landowner vouchers and conservation permits um, for our limited entry hunts that are transferable, that they can sell. They're very expensive. I mean, I would, I would consider substantially more expensive than other states, with the exception of maybe Nevada. Um, but for instance, like, you know, the Pontagon, if you're going to do a Pontagon for the landowner voucher there, what would they sell them for? $45,000, $55,000. Uh, the conservation permits for that same Pontagant mule deer tag just sold for $80,000. So you can see that that's a pretty substantial investment for those type of those type of hunts. It is. So most of what we're concerned about here is obviously the public draw. Correct. Hunts. How to get in without breaking the bank. Yep. <laughs> or multiple. Banks. Unless you got $80,000 laying around. <laughs> Okay, a couple of things that are, are different in Utah compared to other states. We do have a sequence to the draw here in Utah. So because you're applying for all these species at the same time on one application, uh, what it dictates is you can only hold one limited entry permit in a calendar year. So you can only draw one. So the order does matter. Yeah. So how does this affect your application? It, it really does if you have enough points to draw one of these. So what they draw first is limited entry deer, then limited entry elk, and then pronghorn. And you say, whoa, whoa, why didn't they draw sheep, moose, goat, all the big species? Well, they save that for number four. So there's two ways to look at that. You could be frustrated that you drew a deer tag and you missed your chance at a sheep tag, but in their argument is at least all those guys that drew deer, elk, and antelope were taken out of the sheep draw and thus increased your odds if you didn't draw those. Yeah, it's a little backwards. I mean, <laughs> to be honest with you, most other states you have to worry about this because they don't limit you to one tag. Correct. You can draw multiple tags. Um, and I I mean, they do it for party applications in the deer draw, which non-residents, honestly, that doesn't even really pertain to for the most part because limited entry deer, there's so few of tags. There's only a num a couple of units that you could even do that with. But it is what it is. So just realize if you have 17 antelope points and you're putting in for a unit that took 13 last year, you're probably not going to get your goat tag because <laughs> you're drawing that pronghorn tag. So yeah. that's that's something important that most people don't don't realize. Definitely consider that. Uh, the last two species that are drawn, they pull out the lifetime license holders, which that's the guys that bought a lifetime license 30 years ago. They get general deer tags, and then everybody else gets a general deer tag that applied for it. So if you draw a limited entry deer, you would be ineligible for a general deer tag. But you have to start thinking of those as two totally separate species, limited entry deer versus general deer, because they're managed different, the permit is different, and the draw is different. One, one important note, if you draw limited entry elk or pronghorn, you're still eligible for general deer too. Correct. You can still draw a general tag. You just can't hold that same two buck deer tags. That's right. So overall prices, uh, we'll assume here that you're going to apply for every species which you're eligible for. 
which residents, it's a little different because you must pick one of the once in a lifetime and one of the limited entry. Plus general deer, you're going to be under $80 all in with your license. Yeah. Non-residents, they love your money. So they allow you to take an application out for every species. So if you applied for all categories, there's 10 of them with all the species, $15 each, that's $150 plus your $72 hunting license. You could be about $222 per year in non-refundables just to apply. And realistically, those, I mean, those, most of those are going to be, if you're just trying now or just starting now, are going to be like raffle tickets. Sure. So basically you got 10 raffle tickets in there um, for, well, or 10 for each species and raffle tickets for 220 bucks, which is, it's comparable to other states like Nevada and Arizona. Once you break it down because their hunting license is a little more expensive, but yeah, still getting more expensive. It adds up. And now that license goes to $120 next year. Yeah. You add almost $50 on top of it. You might have to start picking. Maybe I don't want to apply for all 10 species categories. Maybe I break it down and just chase a couple of them. Yeah. <clears throat> Your points do carry over. If you end up moving to Utah, move out of Utah, your points are your points forever. Yep. They will never purge them. Okay, now we're going to jump into some species by species. First one is elk. This is probably the most talked about one uh, because everybody's heard the buzz. Utah has a new elk management plan. So this was a statewide plan that was written this last year, and it'll last for the next 10 years. Basically, there's two different categories of elk hunting, if you will, on the majority of the units. First one would be consider any bull units. And these units are designated just to provide opportunities more than anything. They're units that have either more private land, so more difficult access, or fewer elk numbers, or just more difficult to get into, more wilderness or backcountry We've designated those as we don't care about the age class. We're going to provide opportunity. It doesn't hurt the population uh, to give a high number of tags and not manage them specifically. So those are your any dash bull units. That's the terminology Utah uses. And oftentimes, one thing to remember, it can be both. You can have a high number of private land acreage in there and a lower elk population. So it can be a pretty tough hunt. Yeah. But for opportunities. Sure. You got a tag in your pocket. It exists. Then the other <laughs> half of the units, if you will, are considered limited entry units. These are where the big bulls come from generally. So we have age tiers where we classify how old the bulls are that we harvest in there, how old we want them to be. And if we're too old, we're going to give more tags and try to get that number down. If they're too young, we're going to let them grow up a little bit more. So the majority of the bulls harvested will fall in that average. Uh, the bull to cow ratios, we also set permits based on bull to cow. Overall objective, is there too many elk on the unit? Too few. And all these units, of course, have spike hunts on them as well. So some people have said, how can you kill spikes in Utah on these units where you kill big bulls? Well, realistically, yeah, what I would say is the reason we're killing spikes in Utah on these, on these limited entry units, because to manage that unit and Keep that bull to cow ratio somewhat in check because you are issuing so few attacks to maintain that high, at least that high age class objective. You're having to take some or some bulls out of that out of that area somehow. And by offering a spike hunt, you're able to go in and keep that bull to cow ratio somewhat in check because you're not taking all of those bulls out with just your limited entry permits, and still keep that bull to cow ratio in check that way. All all while not impacting those older age class bulls that everyone has waited so long to go in there and draw and harvest. So the spikes kind of just pull some of those younger bulls out of there when they're at their most vulnerable state and help keep that bull to cow ratio in check. When you compare it to, I like to look at Colorado. Okay, you, you go right across the border to Colorado. We're managing for a two to three year old bull. So we're not going to shoot the spikes. That's not going to be legal in most units. And everybody can shoot the two and three year olds unlimited in a lot of areas. And that's all you're going to ever end up with is two yeah. to three year old average. Where Utah, we try to manage for some trophy quality with these five to seven year old bulls, going to have to 
weed out the young ones. Otherwise, we end up with way too many. And the interesting thing is, you know, in this elk management plan and listening to some of the information that was gathered by a lot of the researchers in there is these younger bulls, they're at their most vulnerable stage and they will lose a portion of those. Even though they're elk and they're pretty dang hardy, they will lose a portion of those younger age class bulls. Once they get to that two year old, yes, they have a, a higher probability of staying alive throughout their course of their life. But just like they said, we have an abundance of them. We may as well try to harvest some of them. That's right. Because some of them are going to die anyways. The last bullet there, we we do have a few units that are just almost subunits, pretty small areas that are called hams or restricted units. They have a month-long September archery hunt. And then a November season that's handgun archery, muzzleloader, or shotgun only. Won't apply to most people, but if you're looking for a different challenge, maybe a little easier to draw, there are a few of those restricted. Just remember with the hams hunts, if you were familiar with them last year, they have shortened those seasons and they've moved them into November out of that October time frame. So you're not going to catch that rut anymore. It's going to be more difficult. Be more difficult. Okay, a couple more things on elk. The big question is, what have you done with permit numbers? And when everybody sees the permit recommendations that are coming out, it's going to feel a little different maybe than how it was before. So the old elk plan on the left here, you'll see how we allocated the permit quota based on weapon type. The one I want to call out there is early rifle was 34% of the permits went to early rifle. Okay, that's a substantially high number. What yeah. happened when we looked at this elk plan is the early rifle had nearly 90% success rate. We were very good at shooting elk with a rifle in September. No surprise oh, there. Shocker. Yeah. <laughs> shocker. <laughs> so we've said, how do we keep the trophy quality up, but provide more permits, more opportunity? What they did is they cut the early rifle in the new plan back down to 10% of the total permit. So if you want to wait for a September rifle hunt, you still can, but there's a lot fewer permits. And we put the bulk of our permits, 30%, in this mid-rifle category. So that's going to be October. A little more difficult, falls on top of some other hunts, might not catch near the red activity, but it's a different management style. Yeah, I, I and I think it's very creative. I mean, it's it's more in line with a lot of the other states, although it still is early enough. You are going to see some rut activity. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of those older bulls like that one pictured right there might have pulled off and rutted cows and he's done. But there could be some second cycle come in that piques his interest and you could still have an opportunity at something like that. But I mean, it is a way to offer more opportunity, like you said, and maintain that quality. You guys have a slide for the dates on these, Austin? Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. We're getting quite a few questions about that. Yeah, so late rifle lost a little bit of percentage down to 17%. You won't feel a ton of permit changes there, uh, but that was to add more into mid rifle. And then there's a new late archery hunt. So all these limited entry units are going to have about five permits on most of them. Uh, total permits, yeah. yep. So one non-resident, four resident permits on these late archery hunts. And then there's still are a few multi-season permits where if you draw that, you get all of them, yeah. all the seasons on one. But there's a comparison of the age classes. So you see all of them were substantially less than they were. So if a unit was managed for seven and a half to eight-year-old bulls in years past, probably falls in that six and a half to seven-year-old bull now. So we've seen the permit numbers. They're not going to jump and try to kill all the elk down to that age class this year, meaning 2023. Um, they will try to slow that down and make sure we can stay in those age groups, but we are no longer managing for a you know eight year old bull. They're definitely increasing permits across the board. I mean, they for are sure. increasing permits, but what what we have to watch for realistically is just how that mid rifle season, how that comes in, what age class of bulls are being harvested on that. Exactly. So let's talk about that. This slide I know is a little messy because it's got a lot of dates on it, but like we say, location, location, location. Yep. What do I mean by that? It matters what unit you are in, what hunt is going on there. So remember limited entry units versus general season units. Okay, What that's going to do is determine which hunt is happening there. So any of these units in red or hunts in red are a general season hunt. 
So we have spike archery, any bull archery. That's going to cover the whole state. It's either an any bull unit or it's a spike unit, meaning it's on limited entry. Yep. You buy that archery tag, which is general, over-the-counter, no limit. You can show up here in Utah, buy an over-the-counter tag, and go out with your bow and hunt August into September. It's a great opportunity. You just have to follow those dates. They ended a little early on the limited entry units to allow the guys who waited years and years or got lucky on the limited side that can shoot any bull. They're going to be able to hunt until September 19th, a little bit later. Yeah, and the nice thing about that is that that general archery tag you can hunt either one of those a spike or a or an any bull you don't have to dictate which one that you're going to do so you can actually hunt spike archery if you're in one of the spike units and it comes september 8th but you still got some time to kill and haven't harvested bull you can jump over to any bull unit and hunt till the 20th right you can still do it you just have to abide by the rules along those Let lines you're in. Yep. Yep. so then we have a bunch of limited entry hunts like we said, the limited archery, go until the 19th. Then the early rifle, the hunt that everybody has been trying to draw, is now a five-day hunt, September 20th through the 24th. Short, very difficult to draw because that's now down to 10% total quota. Yeah. There's a short muzzleloader hunt. After that, there's still, we preserved the muzzleloader quota, so it's going to be about the same as it's been it in falls. years past on permit numbers there, maybe up a little bit where the age classes come down. Now the bulk of the hunts are going to happen here on the limited rifle hunt, which is October 7th through the 19th. So these are draw hunts. They're going to be tough to draw, but there's a lot of permits there. Yeah, and you'll notice that it overlaps the general spike, which is also conducted on these limited entry hunts. So what you're going to have is you're going to basically be hunting the, right alongside someone that bought their tag <laughs> over the counter. They're not hunting the same class of bull you are, but it's still going to be a lot more people in the field and a lot more hunting pressure. It's going to feel a lot more pressured than what it actually is. Um, but at the end of the day, it's still going to be a good hunt. I've been on them spike hunts multiple times, seen plenty of big bulls out in the field. It's still going to be a good hunt. Yeah. Just realize that it's going on at the same time. Garth, you shot this spike last year in the top mm -hmm. left photo here. You were on a unit that has a lot of big bulls. Yep. Yep. No, I mean, there was, when when I was chasing this elk, um, I think we we spotted a bull that probably, I mean, I'm pretty sure he was 340, 350 in with a herd of cows the day before in this same location. So, I mean, there's big bulls in there that are rutting the same time. Luckily, there was nobody that was actually stalking this herd of elk when I snuck in and shot this one. <laughs> well, just the management. So the any bull hunts, which these are the general tags as well. There's a cap on the quota there, which we'll talk about on the first rifle, but this is your general hunt, if you will. So half the state's going to be hunting on the spike units, the 7th through the 19th. The other half's going to be hunting on any bull units where they can shoot any bull they see, spike or bigger, and that's the 7th through the 13th of October. So there's going to be a lot of hunters out in Utah October 7th. Yep, yep, plenty. Then right behind there, there's an any bull second rifle. This is a new hunt. October 14th through the 20th, no cap on this hunt. This is unlimited. If you have nothing to do in mid-October and you want to see Utah, you can purchase this permit and go out in the field with your friends and family. One tricky thing about this one, it's the first year they've done it that we've had this split rifle hunt on these any bull units. It's going to be difficult to know how many people are actually going to be in the field during this section. Because if you get a, a first rifle tag, which there is a quota on, you're, you're ineligible. You can't hunt the second rifle. Right. So. If everyone jumps in on this first rifle tag, basically they, they've been selling an average of what that fifteen thousand. I mean, yeah. realistically, they're not selling a lot more than that. They capped it, but there might not be a lot of people in the field during that second rifle hunt. It's gonna be interesting. Yeah. Now, later than that, even if you choose the spike or any bull muzzle loader season, where you have to go in there and select your season, whether you want a dollar tree, the rifle, or the muzzle loader. You can hunt November 1st through the 9th. That's a tough time of year. Mm -hmm. um, most units, it is a muzzleloader hunt, but you can still use a scope muzzleloader in Utah. So you can reach out there a little bit. It, way fewer people in the field. I mean, way fewer. If so you if, you're, want, yeah. Yeah, if you're talking you don't want hunting pressure and you don't mind wading through snow to find some of these little pockets of elk, my opinion, that that is one of the most, I mean, underrated hunts there is because 
realistically, you could go the whole hunt and not see another person out there hunting. Yeah. It just depends on the unit. If you're in a right. unit with a, a lot of private land on the any bull, those bulls may end up on private land in November and it's not going to work. But some units do have glassable country and you can hunt them and probably have it to yourself. Some, they might end up from private land onto public land during those late seasons. Right. Like there, there's a couple of units up north that are going to be pretty intriguing. <laughs> After that, the limited draw, if you didn't want to go for the early rifle and you wanted a late rifle tag, that's mid-November when we're going to do that hunt. And then there's the brand new limited late archery tag if you really want a tough hunt. That's December 2nd through the 17th. Now, remember, there's only going to be one non-resident tag for each of those units, so it will be random. Uh, you know, Some guys have said, what, what if I have a few points? Should I put in for that late archery and just try to draw it? It's it's really not going to matter if you're non-resident because it's going to go random, right? I don't anticipate a lot of hunters applying for that, yeah. but just keep in mind the amount of people that are diehard archery hunters and want to come to Utah. It's going to get some applicant pressure for sure. Everybody thinks they can kill a 350 bull in December with their bow until they have to go do it. Now, if <laughs> if history is anything. It'll 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 show us that they'll figure out a way to get it done though. They will because they they're pretty persistent. <laughs> Couple of things on the tag numbers how this breaks down. A lot of people have said, "Hey, I'm sitting on some elk points. What does this look like for a non-resident?" Back to that: if there's more than one permit available for a non-resident draw, up to fifty percent will go in the bonus draw. So we say, okay, what top units are available in the early rifle? Where in the past, there was quite a few units that had a tag available. Now in that top tier class of bull, six and a half to seven year olds, there are no early rifle permits this year. Zero. Yeah. Unless they change something last minute on us. Yeah. Even if you come down a tier, you're looking at just a couple of units. You jump down to muzzleloader. The boulder is going to have one muzzleloader bonus permit. Same with Southwest Desert. But then you got to get down into those lower class units that have a lot more elk, but they're not managed for near the age class of elk, like the Manti, Fish Lake, Wasatch. So keep that in mind when you're applying. I see people apply every year. So they have got a bunch of points. I'm going to apply for this top unit, not realizing there's only one permit. You are just random with everybody else. Your points are only helping you a small yeah. bit. One silver lining, though, they have they have pulled like all of those top tier as far as bonus permits out of those top tier units. But the mid season where we've shifted most of those permits to that mid season, there's a lot of units that never had an early rifle bonus permit, even under the old management when it was 34 percent that went to it, yep. that are now going to have a bonus permit in that mid season. So. Units that you might have never had a chance of even getting close to having a bonus permit because they never had one for late rifle in those units. Mm -hmm. Now you have the opportunity to actually get a bonus permit, but it's going to be during the mid season. So that's the kind of silver lining that I would encourage people to take a look at. But October 7th is yep. the opener for mid season. It's still going to be a good experience. Be a lot sure. more hunters in the field, but it's, it's not like a December hunt. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, there, there's, I still like say, like I said earlier, I've still been on that spike hunt and seen plenty of good bulls out bugling, chasing cows, herd bulls in there. I mean, it's still going to be a good hunt. So that covers most of the questions on limited entry elk. We'll jump over and give you a few more details on general season elk. Uh, I know we talked about that. If you choose an archery permit that's unlimited, you can jump back and forth between the spike units, any bull units. You can also shoot a cow with that archery permit. They preserve that opportunity. So. Good way to get out, stretch your legs, get your bow sighted in, and fill the freezer, hopefully. Mm -hmm. yep. We try to go out on the spike hunt every year, either archery or later. On that early rifle bull hunt in October, there's a 15,000 permit cap. So when those go available this July, they will sell out right? Yeah, pretty quickly. Yeah, no, they should. But you'll have to buy those. On the rifle spike or the muzzleloader spike, is 15,000 as well. So they will sell out, but it'll take a little bit longer to sell out the spike permits. Now, if you miss that, you don't get in that 15,000 cap. The second rifle mid October is unlimited on the any bull. It is for right now. For now. I mean, 
and tell others, I mean, unless Colorado actually goes and says, you know what, we're going to limit all ours, then we might have to limit ours because then every all the spillover will come out. Everybody's coming to Utah. Yeah. Yep. Um, you can choose the muzzleloader season, like we said, it's part of the same cap. And then there is a multi season spike unit. You pay a little bit more, but you can hunt all the seasons. Uh, there's a 4,500 cap on that. So a little complicated, we know, but we do cover all of these general season elk opportunities in our upcoming July e magazine. Mm -hmm. And all Onyx Elite members have access to that. You can read more about the units that we recommend, ones we don't recommend and more so how to get the permits because general season elk is not until july you do not have to deal with that in this april draw period yeah and the multi-season is going to be a little more expensive yep following that uh their antlerless elk is managed totally separate separate point category separate application time and that's a late june deadline june 22nd this year that is a preference point base so no, no random component in the draw there they would just draw down based on who has the most permits for elk there are, are cow moose you bighorn doe deer doe antelope also available if that interests you but antlerless elk is not until june and the cow moose and you bighorn is a bonus point that not a preference point. point so the doe deer and doe antelope and cow elk are all preference based that's right that pretty much wraps up elk the presentation here i know we spent a lot of time on elk but there were a yeah, lot of one species <laughs> we're a lot of changes okay let's jump over to mule deer garth yeah limited entry deer so basically we got two different categories in utah we've got limited entry deer and general deer don't get confused when you see premium limited entry and limited entry it's all limited entry they just it's 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 the way that utah in my opinion can charge a little extra money for some of those units that they manage for a higher buck to doe ratio. But at the end of the day, it's limited entry and general deer. They're managed for two different systems and basically limited entry is higher, managed for a higher buck to doe ratio, which provides a better quality experience. Obviously you're gonna have to put in for longer. And as we touched on earlier, they it's on a bonus point system. They still do have a preference draw for that top, you know, for half of them, but the general deer, that's all preference points. So it's all preference based. You go in, whatever you, you know, whoever has the highest points, that's who draws the permits. Um, as far as the dedicated hunter, um, that's a program that allows hunter to hunt basically three years, but they can only harvest up to two deer. There is a few hoops you have to jump through. You have to, you have to take an online course before you apply for it. Then after you submit that, if you get drawn, there's only a certain per minute, certain percentage of permits that are allocated for that. So it's kind of infrequent as to how many permits will be available. So it's a little, it's a little harder to gauge when you might draw that. But once you do that, then you also have to complete some service hours or buy those out, which just got very expensive this year. Mm -hmm. But it is an opportunity for someone that lives close by and wants to have that you can usually slide in and get a dedicated hunter, especially for non-residents, yeah. a lot sooner than you can if you waited to just draw a rifle tag on all these general deer units. Yeah, and if you're looking for an area, like I wanna to go to Utah, I wanna learn a unit, I wanna hunt it you know, two or three years in a row and get to know it, hunt different weapon seasons, it's, it's expensive. You're gonna be about 2,200 bucks in your service hours and the permit. But that's permit for three years yeah. and you can take two bucks and you get to hunt a lot. So it's not a bad program when you compare it to some of these other states that are, geez, Montana is going to be close to a thousand bucks for a deer tag yeah. per year. Per year, yeah. It's not yeah. a bad program if you want to learn a unit and hunt. As we continue on here in Utah, we're going to put out a little bit of hard truth here. But as we look at our top rut draw odds for Utah, and we start to see how many applicants there really are, this is a deer example. So limited entry deer, we're talking 32,820 non-residents currently have deer points for limited entry deer. That's a lot of people. Yeah. You say, well, how many permits are we giving out? Well, limited entry deer alone is just 85 non-resident permits. Then we have some limited entry muzzleloader on general units, another 40. So about 126 non-resident limited entry deer permits a year. And 
there are 32,000 people vying for those permits. Yeah. So, well, what, why did I draw this arrow here? Tell well, me about this bubble. The there. reason there's that big jump from 15 to 14 is basically because 14 years ago, the Division of Wildlife said, we're going to start charging everyone and making them purchase a hunting license in order to get in the draw. But as to get a little carrot for the non-residents, we're going to allow you to apply for every single species in the state. Before then, they made you pick just like residents and say, you have to pick one once in a lifetime, one limited entry, and then you can also apply for general. Well, after they did that, of course, everyone that had already been applying in the draw said, well, if you're going to allow me to apply for everything, I'm going to apply for everything because you're only going to basically, you're only going to hinder yourself if you choose not to, because everyone else is going to do it. So then you have this giant bubble down there, which unfortunately, if you're at that bubble or below that bubble, it's going to take a while just to get down to that 14 point range. But even when you get there, you can see the insurmountable odds. You're going to have to get through 2,700 applicants at 120. And realistically, you could break that down and say, well, there's only going to be 63 of those that are actually going to be siphoned off those top point guys. Just do the numbers on 63 off of 2,774. Yeah. So, so it's going to be tough to weed through them. So point creep. I mean, we always talk about Colorado when we talk about point creep because it is a preference drop, but they don't have as many units maybe who are point creeping. All yeah. of these limited entry deer units are point creeping Every one of them. hard. And we're at 29 maximum points right now. Sky's the limit. Yep. What are they going to do? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, eventually they'll probably change the system. I'm not saying they're going to do it next year or the following year or after that. But once that gets to some insurmountable number, they're going to have to change something. So you say, wow, why do I want to start applying for deer in Utah or should I? Well, remember, this is limited entry deer. We're going to toot our horn with general deer a little bit again. I mean, general deer, there's over 7,000 non-resident permits yeah. across 31 different units. So that's where the opportunity is. If you're going to consider adding Utah to your application strategy, I want general deer to be a part of that. If general deer doesn't interest you, you might consider skipping Utah altogether and applying in a different state. Oh, there's, there's, a, I think, in my opinion, there's other states that make more sense to apply if you're not interested in general deer, just for the simple fact that you could go the rest of your life and apply, spend all these application fees up front and never get a return on your investment. It, terrible investment if you don't incorporate general deer, unless you get lucky, which it happens. Yeah, but the, now you're talking a raffle strategy Correct. where I'm going to spend $200 a year, throw it at Utah and never bank on drawing a preference permit ever. Yeah. It's, it's a tough one to do. But there's light here. So a lot of these deer we've shown you in the slideshow are general season deer. Yep. Uh, because just like anything, when you throw some good hunters in a decent area, deer get smart. They learn how to get away. There's always going to be some big deer shot on the general units in Utah. And if you're looking at an archery or muzzleloader, you can draw all units in the state for zero to five points, preference points. So it's not a long-term strategy at this point where you can draw most of those. Early rifle or late rifle, the hardest hunt to draw was six preference points last year. Easiest one was zero. So there is a hunt out there where you could hunt it every year or every other year or every fifth year, whatever it may be. Come to Utah, learn an area, scout it for elk, hunt deer, whatever your strategy is, general deer is where the opportunity is. And as we mentioned before, most of Utah is public land. And the nice thing about our general deer units these are the areas that have the highest populations of deer in the state. Very few limited entry units, in my opinion, have high populations of deer. They have plenty for the amount of tags they're issuing, obviously, but you are going to see deer on 99% of these general season units. Like it, it's, it's not a matter of if you're going to find a deer on public land. You will. You just have to go through and go through the, I mean, there's a couple of units up north that might not have enough public land to have a really good hunt, but even even my nephew, he drew a tag last year, went up there on zero points, shot a nice buck. It's probably in the 170s. And it was on a unit that took zero points for non-residents. And I got to tell you, he didn't know where to go. He just went up there and glassed up a buck, shot it, drug him down the road. Yeah. So 
it, it's doable. And this is where your opportunity to really scout, e-scout, bust out your Onyx and figure out where to go can really come in handy because you can learn these units and you can return to them yep. public land and return year after year and start to learn it. And eventually you might get lucky and shoot a big old buck. Yep. And that buck, that was a general season buck. Yep. Antelope. What's the status of antelope? Boy, I'll tell you, the status of antelope is good. <laughs> the reason I say that is because you look at the harvest success for antelope in Utah, and we might not have the biggest antelope, although there have been some dang nice bucks that, that get killed every single year in that 80-inch 80, 80 class, but not very many. The nice thing is, is we run these antelope hunts, and it's, I mean, it's, it's better than other states as far as even our archery success in a lot of these units, if you look down through them. 80 to 90 percent, up to 100 percent harvest success. And this isn't just like a fluke jump up to 100 percent. There's some areas that are tracking 100 percent for three consecutive years for archery antelope. So Utah does manage their antelope at a kind of a lower age class objective. But they're able to issue more permits and, the well, at least all the education they got is that most of the antelope are mature at three years old. So if they can take and start harvesting and put more pressure on harvesting down to that age class objective, you're not, you're not wasting antelope. And once they hit to a certain age, then they start to regress. So theoretically, they're pretty aggressive with the antelope permits. They've been aggressive for the last five years, but they still maintain quality. They still maintain their age objective on a lot of these areas. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, this is a good backup as far as your payoff species or something that you can get a return on your investment in a shorter amount of time than the other limited entry species. This is a backup to general deer. For sure. And, you know, antelope for me, when I look at where can I go antelope hunting, where can I apply? Private land is a big hiccup in a lot of states for antelope hunting. And I feel like most all these units you apply for, there's enough public land to hunt if you get lucky and get a permit. And most of these units for rifle are at that 14 point threshold I was telling you about. There is not very many. There's a few of them that are above that. I mean, they're more highly sought after units, but realistically the quality in all these units is pretty close. I mean, it's pretty similar. So when you look at it and you're saying, well, gosh, you know, I'm at that 14 point threshold, it's gonna draw down below that. But realistically, it's one of the only limited entry species that will. Yeah, that's right. So let's, let's talk about what's special for you. Well, I will tell you this. If you noticed in the slide earlier, when we talked about general elk, it said there's a cap on adult only. And that's because the, they made a change with part of this elk management plan, which was a long time coming. They made it unlimited as far as general elk licenses for youth. So they can go in and buy a general elk license that entitles them to be able to hunt any bull or spike units, and they can hunt all seasons. It's a very, very good change they made. Gave a ton of opportunity to youth. They used to have to fall under the same cap as, as at least the, the adults, at least in the spike unit. Right. They did have an unlimited for any rifle. So I'm glad to see that change, which that's a really good opportunity. It is. And so the youth license straight out of the gate is only $29, substantially cheaper than 72. So cheaper for your kids to apply, but it's still $15 per species that they enter in the draw. That I don't give you a break on that. Right, right. General deer, they save 20% of the quota for youth. So much easier for youth to draw than adult yeah. uh, if they're applying for general deer. They don't get a break on the permit fee, but they got a tag in their pocket. You can look at the general, like the general deer youth quota, or at least the draws, I should say, and they have substantially better draws. You'll look at some like we talked about a six point unit. Well, the youth rods in there were about two points for That's that right. six point unit. So it 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 lowers that point creep substantially for that. Now, the one thing that they do have on these, but it's a kind of an advantage or a specific draw for youth that is nice. They do have what they call an any bull rifle permit that's a youth draw. Now, there's a quota and that's a statewide that entitles them to hunt those September 16th to the September 24th season date on any bull units, which are general units, but it allows them to go in there and hunt those bulls during the rut. Like, it's not like you're hunting limited entry, no. but it is a better hunt, or at least better hunt dates. And there's no points for that. They can only have it once while they're youth yeah. in, the, in that time frame. 
but it is worth throwing them in for it's a separate category yep yep so you can apply a youth for a limited entry elk and for a youth draw elk. They can't have both they can't draw both but you could apply them yep <laughs> The mentor program has changed a little bit this year. Um, any hunter with a permit can have a mentored hunter under 18 fill their tag. Uh, they must be with them in the field, so you can't sign it over to them. But if grandma draws a tag and wants to go along and let your 15-year-old do the shooting, not a problem. Uh, don't have to be related to them. Just they are filling your tag for you in the field. And that's resident or non-resident. It used to be residents only. But now it's opened up to anybody. So if you live in Utah and you have a, a grandkid, son, daughter that lives in a different state under the age 18, they can come participate in that mentor for youth program this year. Pretty good deal. Yeah. Now, the species we're going to spend the least amount of time on is probably surprising to some people because when you hear about Utah, you think of big sheep, moose, mountain goat, bison. You have all these cool species I can hunt. <clears throat> Why are we spending very little time on it? Well, a number one, look at the permit numbers. Very few people are even going to be able to hunt these species as far as non-residents. Yes, there's a lot of non-residents that have piles and piles and piles of points. Realistically, there's probably not going to be very many of them that can ever say they got a preference tag. There's only going to be one tag for desert and rocky. Yep. Nine times out of ten, every once in a while, they'll throw two tags in one unit. But usually it's a random tag. So it's no different than a lottery. Um, moose is somewhat similar, although they typically do have a unit or two that will have a bonus tag. But we're talking, what, 30 plus points now? 29. 20, I mean, it, it's right there. Um, mountain goat, you're under this, a similar circumstance. Most of these are going to have one tag yeah. with the exception. Usually there's one unit that will have two tags available. but Realistically, there's just not that many permits available. So it's just like you're telling people, you know what, you're already buying the hunting license. Why not throw in for a $15 raffle ticket and know you're never going to really exceed 1% odds of drawing? You can almost forget how many points you have for a it's lot a of these. Point. Like, if, unless you're sitting at 29 right now, like, yeah. just consider it a donation. You can. Stomach the extra $15. Yeah, put in for all of them. It's got some of the coolest free-ranging bison hunts in the West that have super high success. We manage for 100% success on almost all of these hunts. One thing interesting, these are called the once-in-a-lifetime species. And it doesn't mean you get one in a lifetime. You may never get drawn. But once you have the tag in your name and the hunt opens, you're stuck. You have satisfied the bag limit. You can never have another tag whether you kill or not, which is different than some other states that'll allow you to hunt. If you don't get one, maybe there's a waiting period and you can come back into the draw. Jared, for example, he's out forever and he will never be able to apply in the draw for desert. So pick a hunt that's worth your time that you'd be happy with if you got drawn on because that, if luck strikes, that's it. That's all you get. Yep. I'm on the sidelines. <laughs> here on out. Early retirement. <laughs> okay well wrapping up here how to get involved you have opinions about it utah still has one of the best systems in my opinion in the west it's not perfect but to provide feedback so all these management plans are created by committees based on like the elk is a 10-year plan so every 10 years they'll put together a committee develop the plan then when all of these changes come up for this year there's a regional council that you can go to, you can submit online comments and they do listen to non-residents as well as residents, not just for that region. All these meetings are streamed live or you can attend them in person. The regional councils provide all their feedback and their votes to the wildlife board, which is the final say. This wildlife board is independent and separate from the division of wildlife or the fish and game. And the wildlife board has a public meeting as well. They accept comments in person and online, and then they will vote the 1st of May on all the permit numbers. And so this happens for every meeting throughout the year. You can get involved. You can participate. Yeah, it, it really is a good process. They're, they're very public about it. Um, the fact that they have email comments on there allows, a, allows for a lot more participation than in the past. Um, it was they, they basically, they will go down through if you get on there. 
on their website, they will give their entire presentation as if they're doing it at these regional advisory council meetings online. And then you can take and comment on that and give your two cents. And yeah, you, you, we've definitely seen more participation since that email comments for sure came around. So that pretty much wraps up all that we wanted to share for Utah and the basics. And we'll go into some more details here. I do. Yeah, I think we'll start with questions that are kind of centered around the, the changes and pricing barriers to entry, et cetera. So let me just start throwing some of these out here. Uh, again, how much is the non-resident combo hunt and fishing license going up to? I can while, you're, while you're looking that up, um, let's hop on. There's been quite a few questions about what units are experiencing significant winter kill, elk, mule deer, antelope, et cetera. There was a lot of feedback and buzz on that. Dark, do you have any insight there specifically? Yeah, realistically, anything in the northern Utah, um, like your cash, um, was it coal? Colville, um, all the way down the Wasatch front, there's going to be a substantial amount of winter kill from what we're hearing back uh, as far as deer. And there even is some elk that are perishing up there. They're just, they really got bombarded. I mean, they they just, they're not getting a break. It's snowing again today. Um, they Where's probably it? got another foot up there. So it's uh, anything in that Northern Utah, I would say from really Point of the Mountain or Provo North, you should probably look at what that's doing up there. Fair enough. Can you purchase an over-the-counter tag inside the five-year waiting period? An over-the-counter elk tag? Yep. Yeah, because waiting periods don't apply to general elk. Yep. Okay. That's just for limited entry. Are archers still able to take advantage of extended archery season if they don't fill their tag during general OTC archery dates? Absolutely. And I believe if you don't fill your limited entry elk tag, you can still take advantage of that extended archery. Any archery permit. Yep. Okay, perfect. Uh, this is a, a question regarding the OHV course. I'm assuming if you already have the OHV course completed for another state, it would cross over. I don't think that's true. That's incorrect. You do have to complete the Utah's OHV course that is online. Yep. Okay. Did you get the... I got your non-resident. So it's going from $72 up to $120 for the hunting. The non-resident combination license goes up to $150. So $30 more if you want to be fisherman as well yeah okay here's another good question i don't plan to hunt utah this year even if i were to draw so i don't plan to apply however i would like to buy antlerless elk and deer preference points for future years do i have to buy a hunting license in order to buy a preference point yes you do and you must apply by april 27th to get for that. antlerless sorry not for antlerless but for the oh, general, general, general deer yes general deer yes Antler list is going to be in June. Yes. I think, Austin, you marked this one. Uh, Matthew Gogan, how to utilize the proposed permit numbers when choosing your hunt area, specifically general archery deer for my case. What are the factors to consider? Area size, popularity, et cetera, when looking at the proposed permit numbers to try to get your best odds? Uh, I, I guess you'll have to cross-reference that with what the prior numbers were. Because if you're looking at your just your specific draw odds, Proposed hunt numbers, they will have last year's and this year's. So what I'm guessing is look at last year's and see what those odds were. Then you'd have to go in and say, okay, how many did they decrease it? Did they increase it? And that's going to tell you if there's going to be a jump. You can also look at actually, I mean, you can go on there and you can actually click and see the applicants at that point level in your top rut. And it'll show under the more info and it'll actually show you how many applicants that maybe were at your point level that didn't draw that will carry over into another point. And you can see if there's actually going to be enough tags available in that preference draw. But just know that whatever the recommended permit numbers are, just half them for bonus. Yep. You know what I mean? So that's the, that's the target number of permits you should be looking for if you're looking at drawing something in the bonus draw. For limited entry. For limited now, entry. Now, if you're looking at per proposed permits for general season deer, that's we fluctuate those a lot right yeah it's up 900 it's down 300 yeah. depending on the unit so you got to watch that and general deer odds aren't they don't fluctuate as much you know year to year they're not just always creeping up um more so for non-residents than residents but just make sure you're applying checking to see if they're decreasing permits this year or increasing on that general season because it may push you out of the group 
that yep. you thought you were going to draw? Uh, we're going to do a couple specific questions on units here just to test Garth Jensen's <laughs> knowledge base. 20 non-resident elk points looking for Southwest Desert Archery. Draw odds. And is this unit worthy of 20 points looking for 320 plus? Um, it's worthy for 320 plus, yes. Um, 20 points. I couldn't rattle off the top of my head what your odds are going to be for 20 points. Um, it looks like you're in pretty good shape based off of last year. And I believe the recommendations. Let me see. Let me just tell you <laughs> what these recommendations look like. Um, and I can tell you if they're increasing, decreasing. Most of these, they are increasing. So that's the good news because they have lowered the age class objective. Okay, I got 20 sheets here. Ta -ta. Here's, here's a question while he's looking. If upgrading to Onyx Hunt Elite, uh, how would we access Hunt and Fool, draw odds, etc.? Could you elaborate more on how Hunt and Fool helps with application strategies and whatnot in Utah? So first of all, again, if you upgrade to Elite, it's single sign-on, much like when you when people when you're at a website and it says, "Would you like to log in with Facebook or your Google account?" Um, it's super slick and easy. We've worked hand in hand with Onyx to do this. So basically, you click over to the Hunt and Fool. Your credentials for your Onyx will automatically be read, and you'll come in behind the paywall on the Hunt and Fool website. That'll give you the access to the draw odds to uh, our filtering tool on our map and the previous tag holder list, people who've had the tag before you, and perhaps most important to answer this question, 1,500 pages of content a year that are specifically written with the goal of helping you go on more hunts with better information. So all of our, not only the current year, but previous years, you can go back and look at previous years of magazines that have been, we've been around for 26 years. So uh, you can't look at emags quite that far back, but you can go back quite a ways, far enough to do all the research you want. So good news is, is looking at this, you're actually going to gain a permit. So last year there was only two, two permits in there. So only one of those went to a top point holder and that guy happened to have 18 points. Well, now you're going to have three. And it's important to note that when there's an odd number of tags, the bulk of those tags will be drawn in the preference draw. So now you're going to have two tags in the preference draw. So now I, I think if it was, if last year was any indication, you've got a pretty darn good odds of drawing out 20 points. But if two people jump in with 21 and 22, you're out. You just have the random tag to deal with. So that is the one thing that's important to note. We can't predict the draw odds. What we can do is look at that and get an educated guess. Yeah. And with all the new elk management plan, people are going to be spread all over the board and jumping from hunts to different hunts. Yeah. So draw odds for elk are going to be extremely difficult this year. Pick the hunt you'd be happy with if you drew and just realize you, it may jump, it may sink. We don't know. Yeah. There's so many new hunt options. Well, one thing to, to Austin's point, uh, we talk about this all the time. People worry about leaving points on the table, right? So let's say that hypothetically that hunt dropped six points this year. It yeah. probably won't, but, um, and you you applied with 20 and you could have got it with 14. You can't let that get in your head. You have to go after a hunt that you want, um, burn your points when you're ready to go on a hunt and have a great time and hopefully harvest. And like, like he said, of your lifetime. he wanted a 320 bull. That's got perfect. I mean, that's got plenty of 320 bulls in there. You should have a fun hunt on that. One thing I wanted to answer, though, about points, do not apply for points only in Utah. For any of these species we talked about, right? Except general deer. General deer, you're building points. It's not going to matter if you apply for the draw. It's the same cost, right? Mm -hmm. But you're not going to draw without the preference points necessary. But for everything else that's a bonus point, it's $15 to apply for a point and build a point. And it's $15 to apply in the random draw. Same cost. So why not throw your chance in? all these species the guys say i've been building points for elk or sheep like whoop de doo like i want to see you in the draw all those years i'm not stacking up points even if it's just a home run swing yep what happens if i draw and i don't want to tag in utah you can return the tag as long as it's 30 days prior to the start of the hunt but you don't get a point for that year right. so you'll stay at the same point level you do have to sacrifice well you don't even have to sacrifice tag fee you could actually get that tag feedback and retain your points, which is nice, except the general deer. That's the point I'm trying to make. There's virtually no cost no reason, to trying to be in swinging for the fence on these hunts. So if you've got a Utah hunting license, you're going to be in the draw. Don't apply for points only for those premium uh, and premium li limited entry hunts. Yep. Try to get a tag. 
Uh, let's wrap it up with maybe just a little discussion on over the counter. There was tons of feedback on that. Lots of people saying I'm a first time hunter, literal first time hunter. Um, you know, should I choose Utah versus whatever? So maybe just a, an overview of what you could expect from each of the weapon choices in those over the counter units. So my opinion on the any bull units in the general any bull in Utah is realistically in my mind, there's basically one area or a big area that has enough public land, a good elk population for people to go in there and have a successful hunter, have a chance at, at harvesting a bull. And that's the Uinta Mountains. The North and South Slope Uintas have enough public land, a big elk population in there, but it's not a secret. There's a lot of people. It definitely gets targeted more than any other unit in the state for any bull. Um, if I were if I were looking at it and say objectively, and I could go to any state, if I were going to do over the counter elk, I would go to Colorado if I wanted a branch antler bull. If I just wanted a chance to harvest an elk, I would probably do a spike elk unit. Uh, a spike elk. There's there's good numbers of spike elk in these areas. There's plenty of opportunity. Yes, it does get a little bit crowded, but it's theoretically it's a lot less crowded than any bull units or the type of stuff you're going to run into once you get into Colorado. Colorado has an extremely large amount of hunters in the field at one time because they overlap multiple species on their season dates. So if I was to make that recommendation, I'd say if you wanted a branch handler bull, go to Colorado. If you wanted a chance to harvest and just get some good meat for the freezer, I would definitely go spike only. Perfect. And then it, just in general, outside of the UN is where Garth was talking about, big reason why a lot of these others are OTC any bull hunts is because of a vast amount of private land. So that access is difficult or low elk numbers that fish and game is basically managing for next to none, if not none. They don't want any elk there. Yeah. And so you gotta you gotta be aware of that, that there's a reason why there's these OTC hunts um for any bull with uh center file rifle that's yep. right yeah no thank you guys so much for tuning in tonight thank you onyx for hosting it it's always a privilege to do these yeah it's our pleasure i mean we we enjoy doing this and at least uh giving what knowledge we have to other people that are interested in hunting out in these different states and utah's our home state so pretty nice so don't forget the e-magazine it's got a big sheep on the cover. This is the March edition that covers all the Utah hunts. So we go into all details about every hunt, more details than even we shared tonight. Everything in here is updated for 2023, available in March. And then you can check out the permit recs online and apply by the end of April 27th. Awesome. Yeah, thank you guys again. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. See you.